The Board is Set by Gavthrop. The wolves will be here soon. Inritz Hyperface, Astere Graphia, Exulta, frowned at Malkador's sentiment. His yellowed skin creased like a discarded rag. We detect no approach of that route. Have you had word from Russ? I misspoke, said Malkador, bowing his head in apology as he leaned his staff against the broad battlement, crossed his arms, and looked out across the vista of fortifications and warriors. I was referring to the Lunar Wolves. You mean the Sons of Horus, said his companion, the co-head of the higher tower of the Deptis Astra Telepathica. That lacks any poetry. The astropath grunted and shrugged. You're right. The traitor fleet is days, perhaps hours away from arrival, he said. They stood atop the pinnacle where Indrith and his cohort of soul-bound psychers delved into the mysteries of the warp and rode the light of the astromalicon to send and receive messages from distinct worlds. Just as astronomers used to place their observatories on high points to escape the miasma of light pollution. So the astropaths gathered in a higher tower far from the psychic shields that emanated from the imperial dungeon in the heart of the emperor's fortified domain. There is a concophony that comes with them, continued Endrich. Stubble marked his chin and cheeks, when usually he was meticulously clean-shaven. His green robe was a little disheveled, also telling a tale of tension, sleeplessness, and constant activity that was continued in the red rims of his eyes. At first we thought it was simply backwash, warp static. There are dozens of ships, after all. Hundreds, Malkador quietly corrected. Thousands, perhaps. Indeed, Enric coughed nervously. Another recent tick he had developed, along with fingers fidgeting at his robe belt. Malkador observed it all without comment. But the strain of seeking the traitors in the warp had taken a heavy toll on all of the warp psychers under the Sigilites' demands. But it is not warp swash. It is the Empyrean itself, a psychic renaissance that traveled with the traitors, not caused by them. <sighs> What's the business that such a hideous trumpet calls to parlay the sleepers of the house? Speak! Speak! And it scowled in confusion at the Emperor's regent. Macador sighed. Great Elmrans, the herald lift their collations to their lips and announce the arrival of their treacherous lord. What heralds? Now is no time to speak in your mysteries and riddles, Sigilite. It does not matter, said Malkador, dismissing himself and Endric's concerns with a waved hand. He took up his staff and gazed at the Astropathica, Exulta, measuring his metal. Cease your deep watch. There is no more to be learned this way, and your people must have rest. They will be given greater challenges in the days to come. But what of Horus? He is coming. We can neither turn aside his course, nor shall stall his arrival. Better to be strong to receive him in the right fashion, yes? Malkador turned and headed along the rampart, back towards the tower. His next words were for himself. And when he arrives, there's not a living soul on terror that will not know of it. For nearly seven years, a labor force of more than a billion souls had worked beneath the tireless genius of Rogel Dorn, building the most daunting fortress in the history of humanity. And yet as Malkador traversed the Imperial Palace, heading deep towards the Imperial Dungeon, 
the activity was noticeable, as a day had begun. The Praetorian took nothing for granted, even now. On the very cusp of the greatest battle for mankind's survival, he left nothing to chance. Thousands thronged the passageways, moving supplies to just the right batteries and storehouses, or deployed cannons and blades to guardhouses as Dorn fastened some arc of fire, or incorporated the last dregs of the industry from foundries that would soon fall cold. Malkador was more sanguine, although far from complacent. As he had told Hapafes, events had been set in motion. They would not be steered by the placement of forty more shells in the rightmost tower of the gate, forty-two in the lower Malaya periphery. The Sigilite had once read a theory that the tiniest of acts would have profounded devastating consequences, that stepping on a beetle in Chizu could somehow participate a chain reaction that led to the hurricanes devastating the Florida Isles. The theory had been expounded upon at great length with many mathematical symbols and equations, yet that was before knowledge of the warp had become widespread. The warp and the things within it, cared nothing for casualties. They shaped fate on the far gonder scales. Destiny was malleable to their manipulation as flesh of their flowers. The future of the Imperium would be decided here, within these walls, but not by weight of fire or placement of big guns. Yes. Those things would shape the nature of the confrontation that had to happen. The grotesque bloodshed. The price that had to be paid for bringing matters to their head. The Warp Heralds had it right. Their psychic clerions were not just an announcement. They were a challenge from the darkness itself. Here is our champion, they cried. Kneel before him or perish. Not Dorn, nor Vulcan, Sanguinius, nor Jegatai, would beat Horus. Not now that his ascension was almost complete. Together, perhaps. But Horus, for all the weakness in his soul now exposed, was not a fool. He had always demonstrated the ability to set the field to his need, making victory look easy. The challenge was for one alone, the one that made him. The thought agitated Malkador. Ever since the collapse of the Webray endeavor, his hopes for mankind had been eroded. There was only one who could defeat Horus, and only one who Horus wanted to defeat. And Horus had never picked a fight he could not win. Shoulders hunched, jaw clenched. Malkador spared his descent. A clammy fist of foreboding gripping his heart. The door opened at the approach of the Sigilite. Ancient wood swinging open to reveal small antechamber. Not far from the far grander entrance of the Imperial Dungeon. The timbers closed quietly behind him as he stepped over the threshold and waved a hand, brands springing into flaming life in the sconces around the walls. The plaster was cracked in places, and the mural that had been on them little more than a memory of faded color. The tiles of the mosaic floor were similarly indecomprehensible. Worn almost smooth and colorless by the generations of passages across them. There were no other doors, and the only furniture was two high packed chairs facing each other from across a circular table. Upon the table was an octagonal board of granite and pale marble besides a light wooden box, and upon the geometric spaces were set twenty playing pieces. Nagador placed his staff against the back of the chair, sat down and regarded the game pieces thoughtfully. 
They're all plain, spindle-like shapes at present, of lifeless grey. On one side of the table waited a deck of thin crystalline wafers, the back of each marked with the sigillite's rune. He picked up the top card and put it was blank, as he knew it would be. Malkador put the cards back, and he raised his eyes as they came upon a figure seated opposite. He was tall, the hood of a scarlet cape about his shoulders. His expression was stern but not cruel, utterly unremarkable, but for the potency in his eyes. His hair was dark, pulled back in a sharp scalp lock, and in the flicker of torchlight the skin might have been swayed tough and worn by a long and uncaring life. But not a line of age marked it. In a stark contrast to Malkador's own weathered and withered flesh, it reminded Malkador of an ancient tale of a cursed portrait. But before he could say anything to his companion, they spoke. Would you like to be war master? Asked Renovation. Malkador ranged the red pieces before him but his opponent shook his head before he was finished. No. We start at the beginning, he said. A calloused hand started placing the pieces in the spaces at the center of the board, forming a cluster around the rectangular gap, the same size as the crystal cards. Then they all arranged. The pieces shifted color, turning a deep blue, Nakador picked up the cards and shuffled them. Why do that? They're all blank for the moment. Habit, Nakador admitted with a chuckle. He continued all the same, sliding the cards into each other with the deft fingers, before rifling them together with flourish. One of the many inconsequential skills he had taught himself with a lifelong that he had until relatively recently, been mostly spent in isolation. He laid the cards into the slot, and then studied the board, elbows on the hard table. Like the cards, they're all the same, remarked Revelation. It does not matter which you pick. It should, grumbled Malkador. It feels like I should. Every decision has consequences. Yes, but you have already chosen. You simply need to admit that to yourself. With a grunt, Marcador laid his finger on the sculpted tip of the piece closest to him. The same as he always did whenever they played from the outset. As his touch, the surface of the piece rippled, becoming a figurine. It was rendered abstractly. So the arms and the legs ended in smooth nubs rather than hands and feet, giving the figure no front nor back, only the face possessed by any detail. Faces, in fact, one looking in each direction. The twins, it was called. The sigillite lifted the top card with thin fingers and turned it over. Color swirled across the psychoreactive crystal, scaling into the many-headed hydra. All places and none, said Malkador. He set the piece in the home squares directly in front of him. Elevation touched the piece, and under his attention it transformed into a raven set upon a broken skull. Talons digging into the bone, and revealed the card turning black, and Elevation moved his piece to one side also. The shadows conceal, he announced with grim expression. In Malkador's fingers, the next card was glossy red like fresh blood. He set the piece in one corner where it became a warrior, scarred and down on one knee. King of nothing. The hooded assassin cloaked in tatters and card of the blindfolded. Scepter. The blind darkness. The hawk soars, Lord the clouds, the chosen. They continued, activating each piece in turn, scattering them to their true starting positions 
as dictated by the cards. When all was arranged ten figurines each, the game began in earnest. Having adopted the part of War Master, Malkador's was the first turn. He hesitated, fingers hovering over the piece that had become the Lord of the Hearts. A noble figure clad in armor held aloft on the shoulders of two companions. What has occurred could not be changed, he announced. We have played it out a hundred times. Humor me. The traitors are on their way. They will be in the solar system before we finish. We do not have the time. Elevation sat back, hands folded in his lap. Then why do you come? He asked. Am I to be a distraction from your woes? I wish to find the answers. As ever, said Malkador. I seek your wisdom, your insight. Why? It was such an unexpected question that the regent had no reply for a short while. I. He looked into the inscrutable expression of the Lord and wondered if he already knew the answer. Relevation sat impassive, the embodiment of patience. Narkador swallowed hard, confession welling up inside. I am afraid. He picked at the Lord of Hearts. The figure seemed so noble. It does not start with that piece, said Relevation. What is the cause of your fear? This time the answer came swiftly and easily. Failing you, said the Sigilite. Not death. If I am dead, I am beyond regret. To live with failure would be a torment. Would it reassure you to know that if you fail to defeat Horus, your regret will be short-lived? One might even say fleeting. An instant or an eternity makes no difference. Play, insisted the Lord of Terror. Narkador replaced the Lord of Hearts and his fingers moved to the Chosen. He slid it next to the Lord of Hearts. He revealed a card, a golden hollowed eye. Awakening, muttered the Sigilite. Both pieces turned red as he set the card onto one side. Relevation moved the Hydra back to the center and took a card, an ancient set of scales, in perfect balance. Division, he announced. The twins' piece became two, each individual without hesitation. He set one before Malkador and the other in front of himself. The Sigilite tried to move the perfection to safety, represented by the immaculate-looking diamond. But Relevation played ambition, and a tiny but ugly flaw appeared in the depth of the gem. You always cheat, said the regent. You control the cards, and I do not. Do I? Relevation did not seem amused. Or does it simply seem that I do? They are tuned to you and you alone, said Malkador. Who else would make them change? Perhaps it is because you only see them that way. It would be your interpretation that is representative. Or maybe the game is rigged against you, as you claim. If that were the case, why do you insist in playing me? Because you have never yet shown me the final play. You always end the game before the victor has been decided. Makador cleared his throat. We have run out of time. If you have a plan, it is now that you must reveal it. What if I told you that I did not know how to win? You are more powerful than Horus, even now. That is not what I said. Sometimes I play the game as War Master, and you as the Emperor. It does not change the game. Frustrated, Makador snatched up the perfection and used it to sweep aside the Iron General. The opposing piece tumbled, 
the head crowned with sunbeams rolling across the board. Clumsy, said Relevation. He picked up the two transmorphic pieces and set them back into the wooden box beside the board. Perhaps I will fix that later when I have some time. The Regent's card. The Great Tempest. In a flurry of moves, his pieces cut a line through his opponents, separating them into three enclaves. The Chosen aided by Grand Visions, and the King of Nothing moved pincer-like on the uncrowned monarch, while the blind darkness pinned the double eagle blade into one corner of the board. Renovation removed the angel from harm's way, but Malkador played temptations upon it, sliding the card beneath the piece so that it was held in stasis. Silver Relevation's pieces were now surrounded, with only one avenue of escape. Malkador indicated an angle from Relevation's home spaces, where the invincible bastion was held in reserve, having been returned there in the opening turns. I do not understand why you never play that move. The regent pointed to a position behind the Lord of Hearts that would see his capital's peace trapped against his own companions. I shall indulge you this time, said Relevation, as he moved the invincible bastion up to the Lord of Hearts. He nodded for Malkador to turn to the next card. He took the silver of crystal and turned it over. The face clouded, turned into a bluish green, and then resolved into a shape of a hydra. At the same time, both the twins turned red, joining the war master immediately. Malkador saw that he could move one of them into to the space that had been occupied by the invincible bastion, forcing a capitulation. Now you cheat on my behalf. Malkador's indignity raised the briefest of smiles from Revelation. Whatever made you think there was only one Hydra card? He picked up the next four and fanned them towards his regent, each of them showing the same design of the many-headed dragon. Before Malkador could make the move, Relevation quickly reset the board into its previous layout. But that is not my play, he declared, slipping the shadow from where it was being encircled. You've abandoned the anvil, pointed out Malkador, gesturing to the lone figure left amid a handful of pieces. Yes, but you know what happens next. With a sigh, Malkador played the only move available to him, bringing the blind darkness back into play to remove the anvil. He took the piece off the table as Relevation flipped over the next crystalline wafer, showing the return. Relevation reached into the game box, a box Malkador knew to be empty, and placed a fresh anvil piece on the board, eyes fixed on the sigilite. Relevation slipped the return back into the deck end. Contrary to his earlier, Bob shuffled the pack. Sign again, Malkador considered his next move, as if Relevation would leave him any choice. The game continued as it always had done, each time before. Malkador tried to vary the course of his moves. To capture pieces previously denied him. But a turn of a card or a cunning play by Relevation always set the pieces back into the positions they had already occupied, many times previously. Relevation tried to push the library into Malkador's home squares, forcing him to play the misdirection and falling blade together, temporarily taking control of the hungering wolf to intercept the move. On the other side of the board, the angel, uncrowned monarch, and double-edged blade routed the chosen and the king of the nothing. From delaying moves by Relevation in the blind darkness caused temporary havoc until the piece was captured. In the meantime, the center of the board had been all but swept clear of pieces and cards. Only the shadow roamed free, its power much 
curtailed, with the attachment of doubt, shortly after its escape from the early offensive. Occasionally it seemed as though elevation played too loose, his positioning making him vulnerable for a short time before it was revealed that move by move, Markador became encircled until he had no option left but to attack directly, initiating the second phase of the game. There was no choice but to act aggressively now. Though the War Master held the numeral and positional advantage, Relevation held a hand of cards as yet unplayed. Markador's current draw were all spent save one. He laid it down on the Lord of the Clouds. Markador blinked and checked the card again. It was different from the previous games. Depicting not the defiance of the wall, but a maggot eating its way out of sterilized heart. Corruption. The wood came to him unbidden, and he said it quietly. Unsure what to think, he looked up realizing that for some time, hours perhaps, he had been focused wholly on the board. Elevation studied the pieces where... Before, he had been casual. Offhand, almost. Going through the motions, thought Malkador. Including me. He was wrapped now, eyes moving from one piece to the next, fingertips pushing down on the table. The immaculate fingertips. The fingernails pale against the lacquered wood. What has happened? asked Melkador. Play on. Relevation did not look up. The game changed. Why have you changed it? Melkador felt a yawning gulf opening up in front of him. It was for answers that he had come. But suddenly he was weary of that knowledge. In truth, he had expected everything that had passed so far. Perhaps he had simply been seeking comfort in the familiar exchanges before everything would be thrown into an anarchy of war. What does it mean? Relevation broke his attention from the pieces, and for just a moment, Malkador thought he saw a hint of sadness. It was gone in a heartbeat. Perhaps I had never been there at all replaced by a flinty glare. Relevation barely moved his lips as he spoke, teeth gritted as his eyes bored into the High Lord of Terror. Each word enunciated sharply. Play on. Markandor's next moves were half-hearted, playing for time as he tried to assimilate the events of the last few minutes. You are not trying hard enough, War Master," said Relevation, eyes flashing with anger. If you do not win, you are damned. The Regent paled, not sure whether his master referred to him literally or in his adopted role. He was never sure how much Relevation really knew, or had known, of the events that had spiraled since the horrors had stepped from the path of loyalty. He had maddening ability to appear both informed and enigmatic in equal measure. But at that moment, the asphyxiation, if it could be called such a thing, did not irritate Malkador as before, but terrified him. His gut shriveled at the notion that Relevation was moving into uncharted waters as ignorant of the outcome as the rest of them. He had thought the game would be a way for the embattled Emperor to impart his plan for the defense of Terra, and ultimately the defeat of Horus. It had not been the first time Malkador had received guidance through the cards allowing his master to contact him whilst remaining focused on his task upon the Golden Throne. Now the regent watched the immortal ruler of humanity intently studying each move 
and realize that the game might well be the means by which Relevation would devise his strategy. As Warmaster, he had to test Relevation, thinking every bit as much as Horus would challenge it in real life. If he did not. I cannot do this. He said, straightening as he pulled his hands back from the board. What would you give for me? Asked Relevation, once more laying his hands in his lap. His attention focused on the sigilite. My life. You have already given that. My death, if you wish to be pandemic. What of your soul? You may say that no such thing exists. We are short on time. Allow me a little metaphysical shorthand. What is your soul worth to you? I still do not understand the question. Uncomfortable under the scrutiny of his lord, Marco started to consider the board again. I cannot play like Horus. I do not have his mind, his motivations. Then I will assist you. Relevation reached into the game box, and his fingers reappeared, holding a new piece, one never seen before. It was shaped like a jester of the most ancient days, complete with gormless expression. Real tiny chap bells tingled as Relevation shook it. This is you, Malkador, the fool. I have used you for millennia to suit my own purposes, and before the end I will discard you without a second thought. I know what you are doing, said Malkador. You think to make me angry like Horace. You exist only to further my ambitions. A callus on the toe of history, and nothing more, said Relevation not making the slightest sign that he had even listened to what Malkador had said. You are just an indivisible, nondescript foundation stone in the edifice that will be my undying glory. I have lived to you from the very first moment, and all that you believe of me, of the universe and the mankind's part of it, it's fiction. I have manipulated you, abused you, and will toss you away without a single shred of care. One of my legionaries has more consideration for a bolt that he fires than I do for you, Malkador. Swallowing hard, the regent reminded himself of what he had just said. That Relevation was trying to elect an emotional response. And yet when he looked into the gaze of Relevation... He saw only implacable, unflinching truth. He had never harbored dreams of glory, even ambitions of temporal power. But Malkador had believed himself valuable. He had taken strength from being counselor and advisor to the greatest intellect the human species had ever created, an aid to the most gifted psychic being ever born. Compassion to an immortal who had lived thousands of lifetimes. I see you are starting to understand. The hint of a sneer marred Relevation's expression. He gestured toward the pieces set between them. My sons were taken from me, whispered to during transit, to set dark thoughts in their minds, tepidations. Lies. Propaganda. Tell me, Malkador the Sigilite, how many times have you resisted the efforts of our enemies lose? The regent did not answer. For the Dark Gods had never attempted to sway him. They had occasionally, and very recently, sought his death. But that was not the decision he uniquely held. A brutal, short bark of a laugh made him flinch. You thought yourself too loyal. Your faith in me unshakable. They did not try to recruit you because you have nothing to offer them. I have created much for you. In your name. Said Malkador in a wavering tone. 
searching for clarity. There had been no Imperium without my efforts. In my name. Never had three words sounded so scornful. You are master of tax collectors and clerks. No Imperium without you. No, Malkador. Without the Imperium, you mean. What justification would there be to keep you around without your countless army of bureaucrats to sustain you? Even my remembrances, poets and pick-takers contributed more to the Great Crusade than you did. He felt a tear roll down his cheek. His whole body quivering with shame. Markador looked at Relevation with slight pleading and was rewarded with a contemptuous sigh. Some call you my left hand. Relevation held up the five digits and wiggled them. It is true. That is all you have been. An extension of my will. I twitch a thought and you act. I care nothing for the hopes and fears of my little finger. In this steel of yours... Makado opened his mouth, but could think of nothing to say. Do not stare at me like some docile ruminant. You said you fear failing me. But the truth is that you know that you already have. You cannot even bring yourself to hate me when I need you to. Elevation tossed the playing piece aside. It shattered against the wall. He did not even spare a glance for the discarded figments. There was no hint of remorse in his hard stare. Markador looked at the splintered pieces of the fool. Betrayal slid a hot knife in his chest. Its fire spread, inflaming his anger, and one thought burned hotter than the other. That Relevation thought he might care about any of that, what he said. I have never harbored ambition or sought glory, growled the regent, his finger moving to the king of nothing. He thrust it directly towards the angel, defeating the emperor's home squares. You seek to wound the pride that does not exist, but you think it does, and that is your shame, not mine. It is your pride that will undo us all, not mine. He turned a top card. The picture that resolved upon its surface showed a mountain of bodies with the hound at its top, muzzle red with their blood. Massacre, snapped Malkador. With all semblance of empathy stripped away, Malkador's next moves were swift and direct, happily paring off his own pieces against renovations, sacrificing them if need be, as much as the regent pushed hard. Renovation dissembled robbing him of control of his own figurines, diverting them from their planned courses and even matching them against each other with the timely play of intercarnane feud. Having lost command of the perfection, Narkador countered with a picture of a weeping mother. Unspeakable suffering, he announced shocked by the satisfaction he felt as he pulled away. The Warhawk, in the position next to the Invisible Bastion. He really wanted to win. To prove the lie of Relevation's affliction of infability. Even so, however, strongly he pressed to have an overwhelming advantage in the Emperor's base position. His opponent always seemed to spare a card to bring another piece into play from elsewhere on the board. Turn by turn, a ring of attacking pieces converged around the rear of Markador's position. The hungering wolf, uncrowned monarch, and double-edged blade were all poised to strike. I win in my next move, declared Relevation, dropping the salvation card in front of his regent. Markador looked at the portrait. Rithin the colored crystal, unmistakably that of Robert Gilliman. A turn too late, Markador replied, 
His expression grimmed as he realized the meaning of what he has about to do. He whispered the next word as he turned a card, depicting a bloodied white feather. Sacrifice. With shaking fingers, he picked up the angel and removed it from the board, leaving an opening for Relevation's defense. His fingers gripped another piece, about to move it into space. A piece he had been holding back from just at occurrence. The last two had been given to him, though in reality it was the first Relevation had put into motion. The Lord of Hearts. Wait. The single word, softly spoken, stopped Melkador as surely as it roared command. Still with the Lord of Hearts poised to claim victory, the regent looked up. Relevation stared at Melkador, seizing him with his dark eyes. The regent was not sure what he saw in there, aside from tiny reflections of himself, haggard within the shadow of his hood, cheeks glistening with a streak of tears. I win. Croaked the sigillite. But as he returned his attention to the board to place the King of Hearts, there was another piece occupying the space he had to take. The Fool In ancient days, the Fool could say anything to anyone. In theory, at least. Relevation said. He smiled and warmth flooded through Malkador to see the expression. But then both the smile and his moment of hope faded. He was the fool's task to remain to kings and queens, that they were mortal and weak, and not above any other. In the parlance of the latter time, they existed to speak truth to power. They defy authority, and most importantly, puncture tyranny. Markador choked on his next words. Not sure what to say. Even at the instant that he collected his thoughts, the distant ripple flushed through his mind. It stank in the nostrils and brought the thunder of the great storm to his ears, prickling skin and psychic sense alike. He felt the rift opening, tearing apart reality at the edge of the solar system. A chorus of infernal clarion screeched across the otherwise his other sense. The War Master has arrived, he said, though he knew his opponent could not fail to know also. He looked up, but the chair opposite was empty. To whom do you speak, Master? The voice of Lafta was like a hammer on the pane of glass, shattering the roar of concentration that Malkador had enriched around himself. He glared toward the door with the function where he stood, fingers making clamps of her white robe, as she stared fearfully at him. How long have you been there? Several minutes, Master, the functionary told him. The Astropathica Exalta sent me with word that the traitor fleet will breach the warp there within the hour. And why do you stare at me like that? What have you seen? You, Master, playing the game by yourself. You turn the cards and move the pieces with terrible contortions of features. She wrung her robes a little more, and her eyes moved to the table. What does it mean? Malkador was not sure as he followed her gaze, seeing the pieces arranged at the end game. The Lord of Hearts was still in his hand, yet where the fool had been was now another piece, uniquely golden, shaped as a crown. Beside it lay the last crystal card, its image that of an eagle tearing out the throat of a serpent. Alright, that's going to do it for another video. I hope you enjoyed that little tidbit of the Horus Heresy and before the Siege of Terror even started. Getting a glimpse of it from another person's point of view is always 
interesting for me. These are all amazing little intricate stories of time that just slowly goes forward as we watch the devastation of Terra and the future books. The Siege of Terra itself. It's genuinely sad to see a lot of your favorite characters die off. Or, if you're a Chaos fan, die horrible deaths at the hands of their own gods. Alright. Let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of our members of the channel. We have Mr. Cosman123, Coco, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Maldred, Fortis Unam, Nicholas Gurr, Lilac NPC, Starboard, and Thompson235. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel and so forth. If you want to be a Patreon member of the channel, you can too in the description down below. See funny things, do funny things, and um, see drawings behind the scenes, bloopers, and so much more. Go ahead and check it out if you want to. If not, it's fine. It's all on you. That'll be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Until then, be safe out there and have yourselves a good one. Goodbye. The Board is Set by Gav Throp. The wolves will be here soon. Inrits Hyperface, Astore Graphia, Exulta, frowned at Malkador's settlement. His yellowed skin creased like a discarded rag. We detect no approach of that route. Have you had word from Russ? I misspoke, said Mokador, bowing his head in apology as he leaned his staff against the broad battlement, crossed his arms and looked out across the vista of fortifications and warriors. I was referring to the Lunar Wolves. You mean the sons of Horus, said his companion, the co-head of the higher tower of the Deptis Astra Telepathica. That lacks any poetry. The astropath grunted and shrugged. You're right. The traitor fleet is days, perhaps hours away from arrival, he said. They stood atop the pinnacle where... Indrith and his cohort of soul-bound psychers delved into the mysteries of the warp and rode the light of the Ostromalicon to send and receive messages from distinct worlds. Just as astronomers used to place their observatories on high points to escape the miasma of light pollution, so the astropaths gathered in a higher tower far from the psychic shields that emanated from the Imperial Dungeon in the heart of the Emperor's fortified domain. There is a concophony that comes with them, continued Endrich. Stubble marked his chin and cheeks, when usually he was meticulously clean-shaven. His green robe was a little disheveled, also telling a tale of tension, sleeplessness, and constant activity that was continued in the red rims of his eyes. At first we thought it was simply backwash, warp static. There are dozens of ships, after all. Hundreds, Makador quietly corrected. Thousands, perhaps. Indeed. Enric coughed nervously. Another recent tick he had developed along with fingers fidgeting at his robe belt. Makador observed it all without comment, but the strain of seeking the traitors in the warp had taken a heavy toll on all of the warp psychers under the Sigilite's demands. But it is not warp swash. It is the Empyrean itself, a psychic renaissance that traveled with the traitors, not caused by them. 
<sighs> What's the business that such a hideous trumpet calls to parley the sleepers of the house? Speak! Speak! Enlit scowled in confusion at the Emperor's regent. Nakador sighed. Great Elmrans, the herald lift their collations to their lips and announce the arrival of their treacherous lord. What heralds? Now is no time to speak in your mysteries and riddles, Sigilite. It does not matter, said Malkador, dismissing himself and Endric's concerns with a waved hand. He took up his staff and gazed at the Astropathica, Exulta, measuring his metal. Cease your deep watch. There is no more to be learned this way, and your people must have rest. They will be given greater challenges in the days to come. But what of Horus? He is coming. We can neither turn aside his course, nor shall stall his arrival. Better to be strong to receive him in the right fashion, yes? Makador turned and headed along the rampart, back towards the tower. His next words were for himself. And when he arrives, there's not a living soul on terror that will not know of it. For nearly seven years, a labor force of more than a billion souls had worked beneath the tireless genius of Rogel Dorn, building the most daunting fortress in the history of humanity. And yet as Malkador traversed the Imperial Palace, heading deep towards the Imperial Dungeon, the activity was noticeable, as the day it had begun. The Praetorian took nothing for granted, even now. On the very cusp of the greatest battle for mankind's survival, he left nothing to chance. Thousands thronged the passageways, moving supplies to just the right batteries and storehouses, or deployed cannons and blades to guardhouses as Dorn fastened some arc of fire, or incorporated the last dregs of the industry from foundries that would soon fall cold. Malkador was more sanguine although far from complacent. As he had told Hapafes, events had been set in motion. They would not be steered by the placement of forty more shells in the rightmost tower of the gate, forty-two in the lower Malaya periphery. The Sigilite had won 